Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Game Telecom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Nintendo Switch, as Nintendo's hybrid console has the honour of obtaining the highest 12 months install base in US history. Then we're going to move over to Gigabyte's Thunder X Station, which is the industry's first 64-bit ARM V8 workstation before moving to Intel's Xeon E2176, which is a Coffee Lake-based Xeon CPU. And then we're going to finish the video with yet further insights into memory, with Micron's latest quarter revenues telling us that they are up 58% year-on-year. Yowzers, that's a lot of money. But, as I said, first things first, Nintendo Switch. So here's a shocker for you. The Nintendo Switch is continuing to sell rather well, and this is despite the fact that we saw limited hardware allocation throughout a lot of 2017, particularly around the initial launch period. We've seen over 14.86 million units, and that was back in December. But according to NPD Group analyst Matt Biscala, the Nintendo Switch also remains on record-setting sales base. Over its 12, first 12 months in market through February 2018, the Switch has achieved the highest install base of any console platform in history. And Piscatella said this during a recent NPD group report. Nintendo, of course, are not stopping there. They're aiming to sell 20 million Switch consoles by the end of March 2018. So in short, that is ridiculous. Now, my own personal takeaway from the Switch, and I'm probably going to be like the reverse of most people, but I kind of don't mind the handheld mode, but honestly, I've been mostly playing it docked. And I know that for a lot of folks, that's not the ideal way to play it, because if you've got a larger screen television, uh, let's say 40 inches or more, and it's, let's say, 4K, well, there's issues there. Obviously, some games can uh, definitely show the limited performance of the Switch, but I've just been playing it just because I like the games, and for me, something like Mario Kart 8, because I've been kind of operating on limited time recently, I just want to play a game for like 20 minutes, and I'm just like, put the damn cartridge in, play for 20 minutes, have a couple of races, and I'm good. I feel like, okay, you know, I've had a few minutes while a video's exporting or whatever, I'm, I'm pretty good. And if I do fancy playing something more in-depth, like, say, the Zelda, then all more power to me. I have to admit, I will be taking this on my trip to America. Uh, I don't think I'll really be playing it while I'm there, but it's mostly for the plane flight. Like, it's a 9, 10 hour plane flight, whatever it is. So it's like, what else am I going to do? I guess what I'm saying is it's the dual nature of the system, which is certainly paying dividends. There are, of course, a lot of reports right now. There was one that we're going to be seeing a Switch that has 8 gigabytes of memory. I covered that a couple of days ago, but whether that really pans out to anything or not, who the hell knows. I do feel, however, there will be an updated, more powerful, iterative version of the Switch, even if not released in 2018, but probably 2019. And I feel that, you know, the Switch is going to continue its shelf life with Nintendo themselves saying that they want to extend it past the traditional life cycle of a console. And while this is certainly part of an analysis that I could make at later date, the other thing, ultimately, the Tega processor, which is powering the Switch, first of all, there's a second version of it. Remember, this is based upon Maxwell. We've got a Pascal version that Nintendo could certainly opt to customize and then simply use, although essentially the Tega X1 is pretty much off the shelf inside the Switch. But it's also built on a 20NM process. At the end of the day, that process was not exactly a resounding success for anyone. So, at the end, goal of any fab slash chip manufacturer is, of course, to maintain high profitability. And while, yes, the Switch is selling very well, I wouldn't be surprised if eventually Nintendo are forced to either shrink the version or possibly just put out an improved iterative version of the Switch. But hey, that's just a theory. Next up is Gigabyte, and they have announced the Thunder X Station, which is the industry's first 64-bit ARM V8 workstation. I'm going to bring up a disclosure first. Uh, we will actually most likely be working with Gigabyte in the future for press samples, although nothing has started yet, but I did want to disclose that whenever we cover something from a company just because, you know, it kind of is nice. But anyway, this is a press release, so I'm not really going to do too much analysis on it. 
And I'll read out a couple of pertinent quotes. Workstations are standalone platforms, begins uh, Gigabyte's press release, with high performance CPUs, lots of memory, and excellent graphics capabilities. Widely used for advanced software development, Thunder X Station integrates dual socket Thunder X2 motherboard in a 4U tower, suitable for office environments. ARM has a very strong ecosystem with millions of developers and is the processor of choice for a variety of verticals such as mobile embedded in IoT. ARM software developers currently utilize binary translators and cross compilers, resulting in increased development and debug cycles by delivering native performance and eliminating the need for cross compilers. The Thunder X Station simplifies software development for ARM and si significantly excuse me, improves time to solution delivery. And of course, it supports pretty much everything you would imagine Android, gaming, embedded, and there is a plethora of pre-installed software development tools. These include GCC 7.2, LLVM, GDB, Golang, blah, blah, blah. A couple of key specifications. It is a 4U tower, a single or dual socket, Thunder X2 ARM processor, up to 16 uh, DDR4 channels. It is based upon Cavium's Thunder X2 processor and is running CentOS 7.4. The purpose of this thing is pretty simple. And that is you're developing literally in a native environment. So rather than a traditional server or development environment where you would, for example, be running an Intel or an AMD CPU, which of course is x86-64 in nature, and then it's requiring the code to be recompiled, you're instead simply developing on ARM for the platform that you're originally going to be targeting. And so wham, bam, thank you. Next up, we have the Xeon. E2176M, the M being important because it is a mobile part. This processor is going to find a use in higher performance laptops and smaller server devices, for example NASA's, and is part of the Coffee Lake H-Line, consuming just 45 watts, and once again it's Xeon. The reported base speed is 2.71 GHz, and it is, of course, 6 cores, 12 threads, as for the rest of the specifications, they're pretty much what you'd expect. Each of the cores has 256 kilobytes of level 2 cache and 12 megabytes of level 3 cache available to them. Obviously, because of the pure clock speed difference here, it's slower than, they'll say, 8700K, but once again, you've got the power to consider. Instead, it's probably going to be more close to, let's say, an i7-8700HQ. For those who have forgotten, there are also going to be other 6-core 12 thread processors. Uh, one of the highest performing ones that we know of thus far is the i9-8950HK. Now that once again has 6 cores, 12 threads. The difference here is purely the clock speeds. It's much more desktop-like, so we're looking at 4.8 GHz for the turbo, and is supposedly overclockable as well, and has a package TDP of 45 watts plus, and performance is definitely going to be very impressive. So obviously there's a lot of options at the moment for Intel. They've certainly bolstered their lineup quite considerably for the six core derivatives. And you'll also recall just a few days ago that I put out a video showing the first leak of the eight core Coffee Lake S's, which will be launching supposedly with the Z390s. I guess what I'm saying is AMD and Intel are going at it once again like it is the mid-2000s. And, finally, memory prices, everybody, and profitability. So Micron have released their investment, sorry, investors report, and essentially the latest quarter revenues are up 58% year on year. So what does that mean? Well, 7.35 billion in revenues for the second fiscal 2018 quarter. So once again, that's 58% up compared to the 4.65 billion from the same quarter last year. But perhaps even more astounding, at least to me, is the 6.8 billion it made in the preceding quarter means that this quarter is even more profitable. So they're up almost 10%, uh, 8% to be precise. And Micron have already made an estimate that the next quarter is going to be even better. It's going to be up to about 7.6 billion. Getting away from the profitability side of things, 64 layer 3D NAND sales were strong, unsurprising. 
So the automotive market, as well as smartphones, are obviously eating memory up alive. It's also qualified its one times nanometer DRAM at three of the world's largest hyperscale customers. And they predict that the DRAM industry will increase its output by about 20% out 2018. But NAND will be even more impressive. It will grow by about 45% on, during the same period. So according to the president and CEO, Sanjay Merota, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, we are barely starting with AI in cloud computing and data centers. And we project that 2017, about 145 gigabytes per server going up to about 350 gigabytes per server by 2021. Similarly, if you look at flash storage, 1.5 terabyte average in 2017 is going to be something like 6 terabytes with each server by 2021. So in other words, RAM is increasing by just over two times and four times the amount of NAND storage per server, and that's just in four years. What are my thoughts to this? Well, pretty much it's business as usual, and I don't just mean that in a cavalier way, but it's like pretty much what I've said from the beginning. There are some companies and some industries which are going to be profitable throughout. Like, as much as gaming is awesome, and don't get me wrong, I love gaming, but when it comes, and that's me being an idiot and forgetting to, uh, you know, turn off my phone, great me, professional, but when it comes to gaming, for example, the growth is fairly limited, and I don't mean that in a bad way, I'm just saying that you don't need, like, you know, servers with, like, two trillion gigabytes of memory in them. And, you know, the next consoles are going to have, let's say, 16 gigabytes of memory or whatever they end up being. But they don't need to be that much. So when it comes to profitability and things which are just gobbling up memory alive, well, it's AI, it's cloud computing. And once again, when you start factoring in the next generation of smartphones are also uh, increasing the amount of memory they've got. And, of course, devices such as, oh, I don't know, automotive and the number of cars which are being sold. It's going to be a great time you know, for these companies, and that's fine with me. I actually have no issues with the profitability side of things. What I do want, of course, is memory prices to somewhat stabilize, and hopefully as DRAM manufacturing increases, it manages to do so at a pace which is, well, matching demand, pretty much. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.